Welcome to the Historically Speaking series co-sponsored by the Beaufort County Historical Society and the Beaufort District Collection. Thank you for clicking into this video. My name is Grace Cordial. I'm responsible for the Beaufort District Collection, the Beaufort County Library's Special Local History Collection and Archives Unit, or the BDC for short. The BDC is dedicated to supporting research into and awareness of the history, peoples, and culture of Beaufort, Jasper, and Hampton counties in Low Country, South Carolina. According to the American Association of State and Local History, cultural heritage organizations have a responsibility to engage with history in its full complexity, including attention to past struggles and injustices that continue to shape the present. There is perhaps no period of American history that is reverberating stronger right now than the Reconstruction era. Our first lecture concentrated on the contributions of three women to that history here in Beaufort County. Today's presentation looks at the course of Reconstruction in the Palmetto State. At the end of the video, you'll see links to library resources about the Reconstruction era. To stay in the know, I encourage you to sign up on the library's website to receive occasional emails about BDC programs, materials, and services. That way, you won't miss any future lecture notices or special content designed for local history buffs. I look forward, more than you know, to the time when we can safely gather together again at the library to explore the depth and scope of the history of this place we call home. Now, Nancy Gilley, Vice President of the Beaufort County Historical Society, will introduce today's speaker. Dr. Brent Morris brings a wealth of knowledge to the subject he'll be speaking about on this program today, the birth and death of Reconstruction in South Carolina. In reviewing his extensive resume, I came to understand how very fortunate we are here to have this young scholar with us at the University of South Carolina, Beaufort. Brent earned his master's and PhD degrees from Cornell University, and he joined the faculty at USCB in 2012. As professor of history and chairman of the humanities department, he teaches, writes, and lectures on the history of slavery and anti-slavery in America. And as a successful grant recipient for the National Endowment of the Humanities, he initiated and directed USCB's Institute for the Study of the Reconstruction Era, which brought teachers from across America here to Beaufort to study and learn more about this often overlooked or misunderstood period in American history. His published books include Oberlin, Hotbed of Ab Abolitionism, College, Community, and the Fight for Freedom and Equality in Antebellum America. This was published in 2014 and won the Henry Howe Prize for Outstanding Historical Monograph. And Yes, Lord, I Know the Road, a documentary history of African Americans in South Carolina from 1526 through 2008. Most recently, he co-authored the third edition of a South Carolina chronology with historians Dr. Walter Edgar and James Taylor. Incidentally, Brent has been interviewed by Dr. Dr. Edgar on his weekly radio broadcast, which comes out on Fridays at noon on PBS. We can look also forward to three other books that Dr. Morris is currently in, pro in process of writing. Brent's work has been published extensively, including in the New York Times, the American Historical Review, the Journal of Southern History, and South Carolina Historical Magazine. For his work on the Reconstruction Era, Brent was the 2010 recipient of the South Carolina Historical Society's Malcolm C. Clark Award. About his own work, Brent has written, quote, I pick research projects that can contribute something to the conversations we're having now. The questions that folks dealt with in the mid-1800s, especially in the Reconstruction era, questions of citizenship, voting rights, social and economic empowerment, and the power of the federal government, these are questions that America is always facing today especially. <laughs> 
Among his other awards are the University of South Carolina's Breakthrough Star for Research and Scholarship. This is the most prestigious scholarly award for junior faculty. And the 2018 award of the o Order of the South, which is the highest award bestowed by the Southern Academy of Letters, Arts, and Sciences. So we will be hearing now from a leading authority on the Reconstruction Era in South Carolina, where that era began and where it lasted longer than anywhere else in America. Understanding as few initially did that secession and the Civil War itself spelled the doom of slavery, the United States Secretary of State William Seward declared in 1863 that, quote, the Emancipation Proclamation was uttered in the first gun fired at Fort Sumter. On an abstract level, Seward was absolutely correct. One could possibly even push that date back further. Maybe slavery was doomed at secession itself. Maybe its demise was inevitable. But practically, the business of ending slavery and reconstructing America began in a place quite familiar to all of us here, the Port Royal Sound area of the Beaufort District. On a clear, crisp fall morning, November the 7th of 1861, a young enslaved man named Sam Mitchell um, thought he heard thunder, which was strange, very odd, because there wasn't a cloud in the sky. But when you think about it, what was the loudest sound most people had probably ever heard in 1861? A train? It was thunder. That must, must have been what it was. But at the same time, there was no way that it actually could have been that. He asked his mother, Tyra, what he'd heard. And she said, it wasn't thunder at all. She said the Yankees had come to give us our freedom, and those were guns and bombs. A few miles away, the largest fleet ever assembled by the United States was bombarding Forts Walker and Beauregard, two forts on either side of the entrance to the Port Royal Sound. This became, in the memory of local African Americans, the day of the big gun shoot. Within hours, Confederate troops had abandoned the forts, allowing Union forces to take control of the Sound and the barrier islands that surrounded it. The local slave owners and planters soon abandoned the island, leaving behind thousands of enslaved people. Later on, they would remember this mass getaway as the Great Skedaddle. Union soldiers, profiteers, government agents, and missionaries quickly moved into the area. Some took advantage of the situation for their own gain, but others tried to organize the ex-slaves into self-sustaining citizens to prove that a system of free labor was going to be preferable to that of slavery. What began as a Union effort to establish a southern base for its naval blockade soon became what people were calling the Port Royal Experiment, or as the historian Willie Lee Rose called it, a rehearsal for reconstruction. In fact, though, it was no rehearsal. It would be the beginnings of the real reconstruction of America. For many in the Union, the victory in battle was a fitting rebuttal for the loss of Fort Sumter at the beginning of the war. For the enslaved people who lived in the area, it was their first step towards real freedom. Their owners had fled when Union forces attacked the forts, and most of the slaves either refused to join their owners or just weren't invited to flee in the first place. When Union troops entered Port Royal, they found thousands of formerly enslaved people, now without masters. Their legal status, however, was not immediately clear. President Lincoln was not yet ready to emancipate them because he didn't want to anger the leaders of the slave states that had yet to secede. They had remained loyal to the Union. Instead, Lincoln found a useful precedent in the actions of General Benjamin Butler, a man nicknamed the Beast, who a few months earlier had refused to return slaves that had escaped to Fortress Monroe in Hampton, Virginia, which was under his command. Butler had been a lawyer in his previous life before the military, and he declared that the slaves were contraband of war. They would not be returned to their owners, but we're going to now be at this point considered something somewhere between slave and free. While Port Royal's former slaves would have much more freedom than what they had enjoyed in the past, the federal government initially declared that they too were contraband. The Confiscation Acts and the Militia Acts of 1861 and 1862 emancipated some ex-slaves, but there was still a high level of ambiguity about the status of most of them. It wouldn't be until January the 1st of 1863, when the Emancipation Proclamation fully went into effect, that the slaves of the Beaufort District would be truly freed. Nevertheless, many anti-slavery activists in the North saw that the Port Royal area provided the war's first great opportunity 
to prove that free labor and a free labor ideology not based on slavery were going to be superior to what the South had in place before. Frederick Law Olmsted, who had recently designed Central Park in New York City and was at that point serving as the Executive Secretary of the United States Sanitary Commission, wrote in early 1862 that, quote, the opportunity of providing to the South the economic mistake of slavery, which is offered us at Port Royal, is indeed invaluable. But Congress was not forthcoming. When Congress refused to take action, Olmsted wrote to Henry Bellows, his boss in the government, and he said this, I hope the time-serving, shilly-shally, disjointed, incoherent, lazy, cowardly disposition which prevails in Washington will not fail to be denounced and the urgency of immediate comprehensive governmental action in the premises will be insisted on. In a letter to President Lincoln in March of 1862, Olmsted argued that the federal government had a duty to, quote, save the lives of the Negroes and to, quote, train or educate them in a few simple, essential, and fundamental social duties of free men in civilized life. Congress did nothing towards Olmsted's bill and the federal government never implemented a comprehensive or cohesive plan for reconstruction during the war. But in Washington, Secretary of the Treasury Salmon P. Chase championed a plan that would be called the Port Royal Experiment, a cooperative endeavor between private philanthropy and the federal government. An organization called the Educational Commission was formed in Boston with its primary mission being, quote, the industrial, social, intellectual, moral, and religious elevation of persons released from slavery in the course of the war for the Union. They were supported by wealthy abolitionists and philanthropists in the North, and the Education Commission recruited teachers and missionaries to go down south to South Carolina. The Commission's backers were certain that the contrabands, with their help, would prove to a doubting white Northern public that people of African descent would work for a living and that they would fight their, for their freedom if just given a chance. Although there were difficulties, the black men and women of the Port Royal Sound area, at least as much as their own, on their own as with white assistance, demonstrated the answer to both questions was an absolute yes. Whether hired as a laborers or independent landowners, freedmen demonstrated their willingness to work as paid wage labor. They flocked to schools with a thirst for education, barely seen in America, and it amazed and it gratified their teachers. They may not have fully known what freedom would mean later on, but they certainly knew its opposite from what they had experienced before. Even the hints of freedom in the Port Royal Experiment meant the doom of slavery in the South and South Carolina. On November 1862, the first South Carolina Volunteers, later reorganized as the 33rd Infant Reg Infantry Regiment, Regiment U.S. Colored Troops, was mustered at Beaufort, one of the first black units of the United States Army and one of three black regiments raised in the state. In a little over a year, the freedmen made Port Royal a showcase for freedom. Now the Port Royal experiment was not a complete success. Land redistribution did not go as the most progressive policymakers would have wanted, that is mostly to freedmen and their families. And there was pronounced paternalistic attitude of many whites towards the formerly enslaved people. A few who decided to become colonial style entrepreneurs exploited their free labor force. Union soldiers regularly mistreated black Carolinians. But nonetheless, freedom came fully to South Carolina and the rest of the South in the spring of 1865, if not before, through the terms of the Emancipation Proclamation. And what followed was nothing short of remarkable, revolutionary even, to both advocates and the critics of what developed. Between February and June of 1865, most black Carolinians learned that they were now in fact free, that the war was over. With civil war and slavery a thing of the past, black South Carolinians tested the boundaries of their newfound freedom. Like former slaves across the South, one of the initial ways that they conceptualized the feel of freedom was by moving beyond the borders of their former owners' lands and living largely as they pleased. Those who had been moved out of the path of the Union Army returned to parts of the South they considered home. As did some others who had been sold deeper into the South, they returned looking for former family members. Thousands of former slaves picked up and moved to Charleston, where what had been a sizable white majority in the city before the war turned into a black majority of 4,000 by 1870. Others traveled great distances seeking friends and family members that they had been long separated from. However, the desire to move about, as they initially called it, 
most often gave way to more practical concerns, such as meeting their, need, their immediate household needs. Since most land in the South was eventually returned into white control, most freed people, if they were to work, had to work the land of another as a tenant or a sharecropper. Sometimes the landowner was their former owner. By mid-1866, most people were living on either the plantation where they had toiled as a slave or somewhere close by. Now, though living arrangements may seem similar, other important aspects of their lives had changed significantly. The biggest difference, of course, were the labor relations between whites and blacks. No longer able to command African Americans' toil as a property right, many former owners hated the idea of having to deal with their former slaves now as free agents who could negotiate labor contracts. Clashes over the terms of these contracts were common. Most formerly enslaved people sought simply fair compensation, labor that could be done as a family, and an end to physical punishment and gang-style labor. For their part, white farmers hoped to ensure a reliable labor supply by limiting mobility and by suppressing competition. Violent attempts by whites to coerce people they still considered their black workers into signing contracts were sometimes met with African Americans' threats to leave the area entirely and offer their services to a more amenable employer or the highest bidder somewhere else. Only with the oversight of the Freedmen's Bureau was a semi-stable labor system fashioned. Outside of the context of work, most African Americans initially chose to distance themselves from whites rather than to confront them whenever possible. By the mid-1870s, membership in predominantly black churches had climbed sharply, while African American membership in predominantly white denominations declined. The number of black Methodists in the state, for example, shrank by over 99% from 1860 to 1876. And with the notable exception of Charleston's brothels, which one historian called the most colorblind places in the state, Social interaction between white and black Carolinians remained at a very bare minimum, by choice and not by law. One unintended consequence of this self-segregation, however, was an increase in already heightened white anxiety. What was often intended by formerly enslaved people as a means to remove themselves as far from slavery and its memories as possible was viewed with circumspection by whites who were often left feeling uncomfortable at their inability to supervise or to control their black neighbors. Alarmed, South Carolina whites moved to reassert as much control of the black population as they could, short of outright slavery. As soon as Andrew Johnson appointed a provisional governor immediately following the Civil War, white Carolinians eagerly embraced the opportunity to right what they perceived as the wrongs of the past few months. Governor Benjamin Franklin Perry quickly moved for South Carolina's rapid restoration back into the Union. To that end, he called for elections for a constitutional convention to meet in September of 1865. Voters eligible to elect delegates to the convention were the same as had been elected prior to the war. These were white landowners or taxpayers aged 21 years or older. Meeting under the same roof in Columbia where the first secession convention had been held in 1860, the convention was dominated by antebellum white elites. Though delegates reluctantly repealed the state's ordinance of secession, as required, they notably stopped short of the president's instructions to declare it null and void. Similarly, though recognizing that slavery had not survived the war, delegates did not extend citizenship or voting rights to the freedmen. Further, all laws passed prior to the new Constitution were explicitly left in force, meaning that freedmen remained subjects to the harsh sections of the code that had previously applied specifically to free African Americans. This included restrictions on entering and leaving the state, a ban on carrying firearms, restrictions on assembly, and restrictions on the teaching of reading and writing. Nonetheless, Andrew Johnson approved the new Constitution. White South Carolinians held elections in October, and sent many formerly high-ranking Confederates to the government in Columbia. The first, the first regular session of the legislature that convened in December then proceeded to pass statutes that became known as the Black Codes of the state of South Carolina. These restrictive laws, passed in similar form by all states of the former Confederacy, were the General Assembly's attempt to restrict the civil liberties of all freedmen. Among other provisions, the laws declared anyone unable to prove that they were gainfully employed 
would be guilty of vagrancy and allowed them to be hired out as convict labor for no pay. So, essentially, slavery by another name. All males and unmarried females also had to pay a special tax, non-payment of which could lead to charges of vagrancy, fines, jail, and then convict lease. Interracial marriages were forbidden, as was the practice of certain trades without an extensive license, and firearm ownership without permission of the legislature. Mobility was very limited. Children of impoverished parents, or those parents who did not properly teach them habits of industry and honesty, could be forcibly apprenticed. The Black Codes also established a separate court system for African Americans and included a list of crimes and punishments applicable only to freedmen. Congressional Republicans viewed this as nothing more than a poorly veiled attempt to recreate slavery by another name, which of course it was. They refused to seat South Carolina's state delegation when they arrived in Washington later that year. Congress then proceeded to pass, over Johnson's veto and vehement Southern opposition, a Civil Rights Act that prohibited states from discriminating against its residents based on color. Three months later, they approved and sent to the states for ratification the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution, guaranteeing African American citizenship and equal protection under the laws. The South Carolina State Legislature rejected the 14th Amendment by a vote of 95 to 1 in the House. There was a similarly lopsided vote in the Senate that was not recorded. When radical Republicans then gained a veto-proof majority in both houses of the U.S. Congress in 1866, they forcefully took charge of Reconstruction, deciding that the Southerners were not going to follow their suggestions, they were going to have to do it themselves. They dissolved Southern state governments, and they divided the region into five military districts and put them under martial law. The Carolinas comprised the second military district, and they fell under the command of General Daniel Sickles. As military governor, Sickles would direct the new course by which the rebellious states might re-enter the Union, which included, at this point now, calling a constitutional convention, another one, delegates to which would be chosen by universal male suffrage, not just white voters, crafting a new constitution that guaranteed black voting rights, and ratification of the 14th and eventually the 15th amendments to the Constitution. Although whites tried to derail the process by withholding their votes for delegates to the Constitutional Convention, nearly 9 out of 10 registered black voters showed up at the polls with yes ballots, and the plans for the convention went forward. White's plan then spectacularly backfired. Only those who had voted in the election would be eligible to be de delegates. So when the delegates convened in Charleston in January, a large majority of them were African American and contemporaries marveled at the possibility that many of the delegates to the Constitutional Convention of 1868 had been the slaves of members of the Secession Convention of 1860. The new Constitution of 1868 was a document that was designed to create a new order in South Carolina, where equal opportunity regardless of race reigned supreme. When voters went to the polls under the new Constitution, Republicans rolled to even larger majorities across the state. And of the 156 members of the state legislature that year, 85 were African American. South Carolina becomes the only state in the South during Reconstruction to have a black majority in their legislature. By the end of Reconstruction, 487 black South Carolinians would be elected to state or national office, including the U.S. Congress, Lieutenant Governor, State Attorney General, State Treasurer, and the State Supreme Court Justice. African Americans won greater political power in South Carolina during Reconstruction than any other state of the Union. To whites, these new circumstances seem truly like a world turned upside down, a political nightmare where people they considered to be incompetent and an inferior race would lord with vengeance over their former masters. What finally motivated white South Carolinians to once again flex their political muscle, however, was not social disruptions, but economic ones. Besides the charges of incompetency, whites unceasingly directed at black lawmakers and some other Republicans, mostly without merit, accusations of graft, bribery, and, and, and corruption. In some cases, though, they were correct. Even though Republican governments were no more corrupt than Democratic governments had been in the South before the Civil War, corruption became what one historian calls the Achilles heel that divided the Republican Party in the state 
gave enemies an effective weapon which with, with which to attack Reconstruction and ultimately undermine programs meant to benefit the freedmen. The White Crusade against Republican corruption in South Carolina also gave them effective political cover for a shift in tactics to include harassment and intimidation as tools with which to overthrow what they viewed as an illegitimate government. After the Federal Army was quietly drawn down in the state to less than 900 total troops after the passage of the Constitution of 1868, responsibility for maintaining law and order primarily became the responsibility of local officials who had just taken office under this new Constitution. Violence became endemic in the state. Independent dens of the Ku Klux Klan roamed the countryside attempting to reorder society along their chosen lines, and murder and mayhem plagued the Allies of Reconstruction so that they could demonstrate that they were not, in fact, powerless to do anything about it. State Republicans reorganized the state militia to protect black Carolinians and to, to protect elected officials from assassination. Since most native whites refused to serve alongside, or sometimes under, freedmen, the nearly 100,000 soldier strong militia was nearly all black in the state of South Carolina. Now this show of force initially seemed to check Klan attacks. Yet it soon became evident that without federal intervention, the nightmare might never end. President Ulysses S. Grant agreed, and in April of 1871, he signed the Ku Klux Klan Act into law and took the unprecedented step of suspending habeas corpus in nine upcountry counties that were declared to be in rebellion. However, soon realizing they had very little to fear from an overburdened federal government, Ku Klux Klan activity quickly picked up where it had left off before the passage of the act. Historian Richard Zuczek rightly notes that, quote, Republicans at the state and federal levels dealt in bluff, while conservatives dealt in blood. At the same time, Republican unity was beginning to crack. A Republican faction calling themselves Liberal Republicans developed to oppose Ulysses S. Grant's re-election. They were convinced that he and his followers were corrupt and that the goals of Reconstruction, namely the destruction of slavery and Confederate nationalism, had been met, and that these people should not be artificially propped up by federal authority. The playing field, they argued, had been leveled. The fusion of the liberal Republicans with progressive Democrats was an ominous sign that radical Reconstruction was quickly losing support in the North. Republican divisions were replicated in South Carolina as well in the run-up to the election of 1872, and state Republicans had began to turn on themselves. Feeling their power, conservatives also began reorganizing themselves politically to put an end to what they called Negro rule. The South Carolina Democratic Party, long dormant, now exploded into activity in the run-up to the 1876 election. They nominated Confederate military hero General Wade Hampton III for the governor. Hampton, for his part, publicly condemned outright violence, but he did encourage conspicuous demonstrations of force, a policy he called peaceful coercion. Still, the election season was a bloody one, with riots erupting in Hamburg, Charleston, Canehoy, and Ellington. In Ellington, a white mob captured and executed dozens of African Americans, including State Representative Simon Coker. Finally, just three weeks before the election, President Grant ordered more than a thousand federal troops to South Carolina to oversee the remainder of the election season. Now that time passed relatively quietly, but there were few certainties after the elections of November the 7th, 1876, amidst accusations of voter fraud from both Democrats and Republicans and claims by both to have won disputed contests. Yet as South Carolina attempted to make sense of their state's electoral quandary, they were also squarely in the middle of the disputed Rutherford B. Hayes, Samuel Tilden presidential election of that same year. The state's votes were contested in that, is like, in that election as well, and not until the famous Compromise of 1877 were the state and federal elections settled. In exchange for Southerners' guarantee not to filibuster Hayes' election, Northern Republicans promised several concessions. One, the removal of federal troops from the South. Two, the appointment of several Southern Democrats to federal offices. Three, the channeling of federal funds to the rebuilding of the South. And lastly, 
to allow Southern whites ultimate, ultimate control of what they referred to as their Negro problem. On, eight, on April the 3rd, 1877, as expected, Rutherford B. Hayes, now president, announced that federal troops would be pulled out of South Carolina. And with nothing to stand in the way of a violent Democratic coup, and after much deliberation, the Republicans quietly left the State House on April the 10th, and federal reconstruction fiddled to a, fizzled to a conclusion in South Carolina and the rest of the South. Besides the illegality of slavery and the relatively toothless 14th and 15th Amendments, much of South Carolina early in the spring of 1877 resembled South Carolina in the spring of 1861. White Democrats controlled the government, whites held the reins of the economy, and most African Americans, though no longer enslaved, fell right back to the bottom of South Carolina society. Just as federal troops had surrendered and withdrawn from the state in 1861 in April, a similar scene unfolded 16 years later. In pockets of the state, black electoral power continued to force concessions from, white, from whites. Beaufort, for example, was conspicuous in this regard. Areas with high proportions of African Americans were not disfranchised as easily. Robert Smalls, for instance, continued to hold political office until 1913, and what were called fusion, Republican, Democrat, shared governance, survived into the 20th century in certain pockets of the low country. But slowly, almost imperceptibly, Reconstruction died in South Carolina as Jim Crow took over by World War I, right where it had been and right where it had been born in 1861.